to everyone, welcome. Welcome Global Wide to all women, to every seeker, to everyone who is longing for food for the soul, for a future that is guaranteed. Remember that your love was an everlasting love. This is your pastor, Yanni. As I say, a future guarantee. Our citizenship for those who are in Christ is in heaven. We walk here on earth to fulfill the purpose in glorifying God in everything we do as we became Christians. And the letter to the Ephesians is a very good study and an example what we have what is to let go and to walk faithful with your God today I'm going to talk about I know a secret and we stay in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 to 13 this is your pastor Yeti Twice in this letter, Paul reminded his readers that he was a prisoner, Ephesians 3, verse 1, and Ephesians 4, verse 1. And at the close, he called himself an ambassador in bounds, Ephesians 6, 20. No doubt, the Ephesians were asking, why is Paul a prisoner in Rome? Why would God permit such a thing? In this paragraph, Paul explained his situation and, in doing so, also explained one of the greatest truths in this letter, the mystery of the church. In the New Testament, a mystery is not something airy or inscrutable, but rather a truth that was hidden by God in times past and is now revealed to those who are in his family. A mystery is a secret, a sacred secret that is unknown to unbelievers, but understood and treasured by the people of God. Paul explained the mystery the Gentile believers are now united to the Jewish believers in one body. The Church, Ephesians 3, verse 6. He had mentioned this new work of God, so his readers were familiar with the concept. Ephesians 1, verse 10 chapter 2 verse 11 and verse 22 but now Paul explained the tremendous impact of the sacred secret that had so possessed his own life and ministry actually this explanation is almost a parenthesis in the letter For Paul began this section with the intention of praying for his readers. Compare Ephesians 3 verse 1 and verse 14. 
his use of the words prisoner and Gentiles led him into this important explanation of the mystery of the church. And in this explanation, Paul showed us that the mystery is important to four different groups of persons. First, it was important to Paul. So we are in chapter 3, verse 1 to 5 now. The best way to grasp the importance of the mystery in Paul's life is to focus on the two descriptions he gave of himself in this section. He began by calling himself a prisoner. Ephesians 3, verse 1. And then he called himself a minister, Ephesians 3, verse 7. Paul was a prisoner because he believed in God's new program of unity, believing Jews and Gentiles into one body, the church. The Orthodox Jews in Paul's days considered the Gentiles dogs. But some of the Christian Jews did not have a much better attitude toward the Gentiles. Paul was a leader in Jewish orthodoxy when Christ saved him. Galatians 1 verse 11 to 24 and Philippians 3 verse 1 to 11. And it is important to write the scriptures down. I know in a study, <coughs> excuse me, there are a lot of scripture verses, but it's the meaning that you write them down. And after you listen, you go study for yourself. You cannot just read the Bible and just close the book and put it on a shelf again. It's a life source. It's the bread of life. It's a guidance. It's a revelation of God. And how God was using prophets and scribes who wrote, like Paul, the letters, the pastoral letters, the gospels, about the evangelists, and so on and so on. So yet in the providence of God, he began his early ministry in a local church in Antioch that was composed of both Jews and Gentiles. Acts 11, 19-26 When the council was held at Jerusalem to determine the status of believing Gentiles, Paul courageously defended the grace of God and the unity of the church. Acts 15 and Galatians 2 verses 1 to 10. Paul knew from the very beginning of his Christian life that God had called him to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Acts 9 15. <clears throat> My voice today. Oh, maybe I talk too much, right? Um, so, and Acts 26 verse 13 to 18. And he was not disobedient to that call. Wherever Paul ministered, he founded local churches composed of believing Jews and Gentiles, all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.28 And because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, he was accused of being prejudiced against the Jews, particularly the Jewish believers in Jerusalem and in Judea. The special offering Paul collected for the needy believers in Judea should have shown the goodwill that exists between these churches and the churches Paul founded. Paul delivered the offering in person, Acts 21, 17 to 19, and from all evidence, it was graciously received by the Judean Christians. Even though Paul took drastic steps to pacify the Jewish believers, there was a riot in the temple, and Paul was arrested. 
Paul defended himself by giving his personal testimony and the crowd listened to him until he got to the word Gentiles and then they write again. The rest of the book of Acts explains how Paul got from Jerusalem to Rome, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, Ephesians 3 verse 1. Had Paul compromised his message and encouraged the selfish prejustice of the Jews, he probably would have been released. Paul was not only a prisoner because of the mystery, but he was also a minister. God gave him a dispensation, a stewardship, that he might go to the Gentiles. Not only with the good news of salvation, through Christ, but also with the message that Jews and Gentiles are not one in Christ. The word dispensation comes from the two Greek words oikos, meaning house, and nomos, meaning law. Our English word economy is derived directly from the Greek oikonomia, the law of the house, or a stewardship, a management. God has different ways of managing his program from age to age. And this different stewardship, Bible students sometimes call dispensations. Ephesians 1, 9-10. God's principles do not change, but his methods of dealing with humankind do change over the course of history. Distinguish the ages, wrote St. Augustine, and the scriptures harmonize. God made Paul a steward of the mystery with the responsibility of sharing it with the Gentiles. It was not enough simply to win them to Christ and form them into local assemblies. He was also to teach them their wonderful position in Christ as members of the body. Sharing God's grace equally with the Jews. This truth had not been revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. It was revealed to the New Testament apostles and prophets. See Ephesians 4 verse 11, by the Holy Spirit. God revealed it personally to Paul, and it was his responsibility to share it with the Gentiles, Christians. This was the dispensation or stewardship. Because that is what God had given him. And because Paul was a faithful steward, he was now a prisoner in Rome. Like Joseph in the Old Testament, his faithful stewardship resulted in false arrest and imprisonment. But in the end, it brought great glory to God and salvation to Jews and Gentiles. Second, it was important to the Gentiles. 3, verse 6 to 8. In Ephesians 2, verse 11 to 22, we discovered that Christ's work on the cross accomplished much more than the salvation of individual sinners. It reconciled Jews and Gentiles to each other and to God. It is this truth that Paul presented here, and you can imagine what exciting news it would be. The truth of the mystery revealed to believing Gentiles that they have a wonderful new relationship through Jesus Christ. To begin with, 
they are fellow heirs with the Jews and share in the spiritual riches God gave them because of his covenant with Abraham. In Christ, being a Jew or a Gentile is neither an asset nor a liability. For together we share the riches of Christ. The Gentiles are also fellow members of the body of Christ, the church. There is one body, Ephesians 4 verse 4. Our human birth determines our racial distinctions, but our spiritual birth unites us as members of the same body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14. Christ is the head of his body, Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. And each individual member shares in the ministry, Ephesians 4, 10 to 13. Finally, in their new relationship, the Gentiles are partakers of God's promises. Once they were outside the covenant with no claims on the promises of God, Ephesians 2, 12. But now in Christ, they share the promise of God with the believing Jews. In Romans 11, 13 to 15, Paul explained that believing Gentiles share in the spiritual riches that God gave to Israel. But in Romans 11, 1 to 12, Paul explained that God has not, because of the church, negated his promises to Israel. The church today shares in the spiritual riches of Israel, but one day God will restore his people and fulfill his promises concerning their land and their kingdom. The mystery not only given believing Gentiles a new relationship, it also reveals that there is a new power available to them. Ephesians 3, 7. This power is illustrated in the life of Paul. God saved him by grace and gave him the stewardship, a special ministry to the Gentiles. But God also gave Paul the power to accomplish this ministry. The word working here is in Ikea. The word power is dynamis or dunamis, which gives us our words dynamic and dynamite. For those who don't learn the Greek, as I also didn't learn the Greek, we still can educate ourselves in a dictionary with the biblical dictionary with the Greek and the Hebrew where you find the explanations and the Greek and Hebrew words gives us a deeper root understanding of the words we're using now in English because it's sometimes so poor translated. So Paul has already told us about this mighty power in Ephesians 1, 19-23. And he will mention it again in Ephesians 3, verse 20, and Ephesians 4, 16. The mystery, I mean the mighty resurrection power of Christ, is available to us for daily life and service. Finally, new riches are available to the Gentiles. The unsearchable riches of Christ Ephesians 3 verse 8. Paul called them exceeding riches. Ephesians 2 verse 7. But there he described them as unfathomable. The words can also be translated untraceable, which means that they are so vast you cannot discover their end. Some students suggest that untraceable might also carry the idea that the mystery cannot be traced in the Old Testament. Since it was hidden by God. Are these riches available to every believer? Yes. In fact, Paul made it clear that he himself had no special claim on God's wealth. 
for he considered himself less than the least of all saints. Ephesians 3 verse 8. The name Paul, Paulus, means little, means little in Latin. And perhaps Paul bore this name because he realized how insignificant he really was. Acts 13 verse 9. He called himself the least of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9. But at least he was an apostle, which is more than we can claim. Not only does he call himself less than the least of all saints, but also he calls himself the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy, Timothy 1 verse 15. Understanding the deep truths of God's word does not give a man a big head. It gives him a broken and contrite heart. Three, it is important to the angels. Three, nine to ten. Perhaps at this point you are asking yourself the question, why did God keep his secret about the church hidden for so many centuries? Certainly, the Old Testament clearly states that God will save the Gentiles through Israel. But now here are we told that both Jews and Gentiles will form a new creation. The church, the body of Christ, it was this mystery that the Spirit revealed to Paul and other leaders in the early church, and that was so difficult for the Jews to accept. Paul told us that the principalities and powers are also involved in this great secret. God is educating the angels by means of the church, by the principalities and powers. Paul meant the angelic beings created by God, both good and evil. Ephesians 1 21, chapter 6 for 12, Colossians 1 16, and chapter 2 15 in Colossians. Angels are created beings and are not omniscient. In fact, Paul indicated that during the Old Testament period, the angels were curious about God's plan of salvation than being worked out on earth. 1 Peter 1, 10-12 Certainly, the angels rejoice at the repentance of a lost sinner. Luke 15, verse 10 and Paul suggests that the angels watched the activities of the local assembly. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 10 We are made a spectacle unto the world, unto the angels, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9. When then do the angels learn from the church? The manifold wisdom of the God. Ephesians 3 verse 10 and certainly the angels know about the power of God as seen in his creation but the wisdom of God as seen in his creation the church is sometimes something new to them unsaved men including wise philosophers look at God's plan of salvation and consider it foolishness 1 Corinthians 1 18 to 31 but the angels watch the outworking of God's salvation and they praise his wisdom. Paul called it manifold wisdom, and this word carries the idea of variegated or many colored. This suggests the beauty and variety of God's wisdom in his great plan of salvation. But there is another fa facet to this truth that must be explored. What are the evil angels learning from God's mystery? That their leader, Satan, does not have any wisdom. 
Satan knows the Bible, and he understood from the Old Testament scriptures that the Savior would come, when he would come, how he would come, and where he would come. Satan also understood why he would come as far as redemption is concerned. But some here, but now here in the Old Testament, would Satan find any prophecy concerning the church? The mystery of Jews and Gentiles united in one body. Satan could see unbelieving Jews rejecting their Messiah, and he could see Gentiles trusting the Messiah, but he could not see both believing Jews and Gentiles united in one body, seated with Christ in the heavenlies and completely victoriously over Satan. Had Satan known the far-reaching result of the cross, no doubt he would have altered his plans accordingly. God hide this great plan from the beginning of the world, but now he wants the mystery to be known by his church, and this is why he made Paul a steward of this great truth. Ephesians 3 verse 9 should read, and to make all men see what is the stewardship of the mystery. Here is an amazing truth. Now all believers are to be faithful stewards of this great truth. This secret secret that was so important to Paul and to the Gentiles and the angels is now in our hands. 4. It should be important to Christians today. We still are in chapter 3 verse 11 to 13. When God saved Paul, he deposited with him the precious treasures of gospel truth. 1 Timothy 1 verse 11. Paul in turn committed these truths to others, exhorting them to commit the truth to faithful men who would guard them and share them. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. 1 Timothy 6 verse 20. At the close of his life, Paul would say to the glory of God, I have kept the faith. During those apostolic days, the truths of the gospel and the mystery were guarded, preached and handed down to faithful men and women. But a study of church history reveals that one by one, many of the basic truths of the word of God were lost during the centuries that followed. God had his faithful people, a minority at all times, but many of the great truths of the word were buried under man-made theology, traditions, and rituals. Then God's Spirit began to open the eyes of seeking souls, and these great truths were unveiled again. Martin Luther championed justification by faith. Other spiritual leaders rediscovered the person and work of the Holy Spirit, the glorious truth of the returning of Jesus Christ, and the joy of the victorious Christian life. In recent years, the truth of the mystery has again excited the hearts of God's people. We rejoice that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Most of us identify Napoleon Bonaparte as the would-be conqueror of Europe, but not many would name him as a patron of arts and science. Yet he was in July 1798 Napoleon began to occupy Egypt but by September 1801, he was forced to get out. Those three years meant failure as far as military and political plans were concerned, but they meant success in one area that greatly interested him, archaeology. For in August 
1799, a Frenchman named Brousson discovered the Rosette Stone about 30 miles from Alexandria. This discovery gave the archaeologist the key to understanding Egyptian hieroglyphics. It opened the door to modern Egyptian studies. The mystery is God's Rosetta Stone. It is the key to what he promised in the Old Testament. What Christ did in Gospels, what the early church did in the book of Acts, what Paul and the other writers teaches in the epistles, and what God will do as recorded in the book of Revelation. God's program today is not the headship of Israel, Deuteronomy 28, 1-13, but the headship of Christ over his church. We today are under a different stewardship from that of Moses and the prophets, and we must be careful not to confuse what God has clarified. The reason many churches are weak and ineffective is because they do not understand what they have in Christ. And the cause of this is often spiritual leaders who are not good stewards of the mystery. Because they do not rightly divide the word of truth. They confuse their people concerning their spiritual position in Christ. And they rob their people of Christian of the spiritual wealth in Christ. This great truth concerns the church is not a divine afterthought. It is a part of God's eternal purpose in Christ. To ignore this truth is to sin against the Father who planned it the Son whose death made it possible, and the Spirit who today seeks the work in our lives to accomplish what God has planned. When you understand this, when you understand this truth, it gives you great confidence and faith. When you know what God is doing in the world and you work with Him, you can be sure that He will work in you and for you. All of his divine resources are available to those who sincerely wants to do his will and help him accomplish his purposes on earth. The early church thought that the gospel belonged to the Jews because it had come through them and to them first, until Peter, by divine direction, went to the Gentiles. In Acts 10, the Jewish believers thought that a Gentile had to become a Jew before he could become a Christian. God's Spirit gradually revealed to the churches that God was doing a new thing. He was calling out a people for his name from both the Jews and Gentiles. There are no national, racial, political, physical, or social distinctions in the church. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bound nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There can not be division. There cannot be favoritism. And there is. And there is division. There is so much wrong in the church as of today. That's why I think it's important to study the book of Ephesians. I mean the letter. We are not here to judge. We have to give social justice, which means that every word I just mentioned national, racial, political, and so on. It's not coming from the words 
of the mouth of God. But from us, we make the vision. God made us one. We spread out wrong ideas. We make wrong, let me say the word, doctrines. It's not coming from God. I mentioned this again that you should memorize this verse. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bound nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. Now who is this translated in every denomination? Think about it. In Galatians 3 verse 28 you can find this verse. But an understanding of God's program in this present age not only gives the believer confidence toward God, it also gives him courage in the difficult circumstances of life. False sufferings for the Gentiles would mean glory for the Gentiles. In the Old Testament age, when God's people obeyed, God blessed them materially, nationally, and physically. Deuteronomy 28. And if they disobeyed, he withdrew his blessings. This is not the way he deals with the church today. Our blessings are spiritual, not material. Ephesians 1 verse 3. They have all been given to us completely in Christ. We appropriated them by faith. But if we disobey God, he does not revoke them. We simply lose the enjoyment and enrichment of them. Paul was certainly a dedicated, spirit-filled man, yet he was suffering as his prisoner. Paul made it clear that physical, material blessings are not always the experience of the dedicated Christian. People who do not understand God's mystery in His church are trying to make spiritual progress with the wrong map or to change the figure they are trying to build with the wrong blueprints. God's church on this earth, the local assemblies, are not supposed to be either Gentile culture cliques or Jewish culture cliques. For a German church to refuse fellowship to a sweet is just as unscriptural as for a Jew's congregation to refuse a Gentile. God's church is not to be shackled by culture, class, or any other physical distinction. It is a spiritual entity that must submit the headship of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit. Yes. God had a secret, but God does not want it to be a secret anymore. If you understand your wonderful position in Christ, then live it up to it and share the blessing with others. The secret was important to Paul, to the Gentiles, and to the angels, and it ought to be important to you and me today. study this chapter of Ephesians and I give you one question read Ephesians 3 1 to 13 as I just said Paul speaks of a mystery that Gentiles are now welcome in the family of God why was this such a big deal and it is such a big deal of today well you could say well you know there are synagogues and all that but this is not what I'm talking about it's what is what said no Gentiles no Greek no male no female okay so this is the end and tomorrow we're gonna do 
chapter 3, but verses 14 to 21. But that's for tomorrow. There's enough stuff in this chapter. <coughs> may the peace of God be with you and stays with you. And may His light shine upon you and keep you safe. Sorry for my voice today. Have a wonderful day as you walk with your God. God bless. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye-bye.